Picture this. You're at a lake in 1965, watching a Volkswagen-sized car drive straight down the boat ramp. The driver waves at horrified onlookers as water rises past the bumper, past the doors, nearly to the windows. But instead of sinking like a stone, this bizarre machine starts puttering across the lake at seven knots, its occupants completely dry. This wasn't some military prototype or millionaire's toy. This was the Amphicar Model 770, a 3390 filer production vehicle you could buy at a dealership, drive to work Monday through Friday, then sail across the lake on Saturday. Between 1961 and 1968, a West German company called Quant Group built 3,378 of these amphibious automobiles. Not concepts, not prototypes. Production vehicles with VN numbers, Coast Guard registration, and warranty cards. The engineering challenge was staggering. Create a vehicle that could cruise at highway speeds, navigate city traffic, launch off a boat ramp, and float without sinking, all while meeting both automotive safety standards and marine regulations. The solution required rethinking everything from the ground up. The heart of this floating contradiction was a rear-mounted Triumph Herald engine. Early models made 43 horsepower from 1.1 liters. Later versions bumped up to 1.2 liters and 65 horsepower. Not exactly muscle car territory. But here's where it gets clever. That modest engine had to power two completely different propulsion systems through one transmission. The engineers designed a special four-speed manual gearbox with a transfer case that could send power to either the rear wheels or twin propellers. A simple lever on the tunnel switched between land and water drive. No complex electronics, no hydraulics, just mechanical simplicity that actually worked. The propellers themselves were engineering poetry. Twin units, fully reversible, mounted under the rear bumper. They could swing up when driving on land to avoid damage, then drop down for water operation. Each prop was precisely pitched to give maximum thrust at the engine's torque peak. In first gear water mode, you got maximum thrust for maneuvering in harbors. Fourth gear gave you that claimed seven knot top speed, though most owners discovered third gear was the sweet spot between speed and fuel consumption. But propulsion was only half the equation. The Amphicar had to float, and float safely with passengers and cargo. The body was essentially a boat hull with wheels. Every seam was continuously welded, not spot welded like a normal car. The floor pan used thicker steel than standard automobiles shaped with compound curves for strength and buoyancy. Hidden inside the rocker panels were sealed air chambers, essentially pontoons integrated into the car's structure. The doors required special double seals, rubber gaskets that compressed against each other when closed, creating a watertight barrier that could handle wave action and spray. The Model 770 designation wasn't random. Those numbers represented the company's performance claims seven knots on water, 70 miles per hour on land. In reality, most Amphicars topped out around 65 Femitpaftarms on pavement and that seven-knot water speed required perfect conditions and a light load. But even meeting those modest targets required solving unprecedented engineering problems. Take steering, for instance. On land, the front wheels steered normally through a conventional steering box. But in water, those same front wheels became rudders. The engineers angled them slightly toe-in when straight, which helped with directional stability and currents. Turn the steering wheel in water, and the submerged front tires would deflect water flow, causing the amphicar to change direction. It was crude, but effective, though the turning radius in water was roughly that of a small freighter. Weight distribution was critical. Too much weight forward, and the nose would plow under waves. Too much aft, and the props would cavitate, losing thrust. The Amphicar's engineers placed the engine, transmission, and fuel tank in the rear, balanced by the passenger's steering gear and spare tire up front. Fully loaded, the car weighed 2,324 pounds dry, increasing to nearly 2,800 pounds with fluids and passengers. 
the center of gravity had to work both for road handling and marine stability. One compromise, the Amphicare sat higher than normal cars, giving it a distinctive, slightly awkward stance on land. Water entry was the moment of truth. Owners learned to approach boat ramps at a specific angle and speed. Too fast and you'd slam the front suspension. Too slow and you might stall the engine as water resistance increased. The technique was to maintain steady throttle as the car transitioned from rolling to floating. That first moment when the wheels left the ramp and the car became a boat never got old. Passengers often screamed. Onlookers always stared. President Lyndon B. Johnson owned an amphicar at his Texas ranch and turned terrorizing guests into an art form. He'd drive visitors around the property, then suddenly veer toward the lake shouting, The brakes failed! The brakes are out! As guests panicked, he'd drive straight into the water, only revealing the joke as the amphicar began floating. The Secret Service was not amused, but LBJ did it repeatedly, claiming it was the best way to judge someone's character under pressure. The Amphicar's transmission was a masterpiece of mechanical compromise. In addition to the standard four forward gears and reverse for road use, it had a separate four-speed range for water propulsion. The transfer case that switched between modes used a dog clutch system similar to early four-wheel drive vehicles. Engage water drive while the wheels were still spinning and you'd grind gears horrifically. The procedure was specific. Come to a complete stop, clutch in, shift to neutral, engage the water drive lever, then select your water gear. Get it wrong and you'd need a new transfer case. Cooling the engine presented unique challenges. On land, a conventional radiator handled cooling duties. But in water, especially warm lake water in summer, the radiator couldn't get enough airflow. The solution was a secondary heat exchanger that used lake water for cooling. A small impeller pump driven off the propeller shaft circulated water through tubes in the bilge. It worked, but meant the bilge area had to be kept scrupulously clean to prevent clogging. One owner's manual warning, do not operate in waters with heavy algae growth. The electrical system was another nightmare. Every component that might get wet needed to be waterproofed. The distributor got a special sealed cap. The generator was mounted high with splash shields. All wiring connections used marine-grade terminals with rubber boots. Still, Amphicar owners quickly learned to carry spare points, condensers, and a full set of spark plugs sealed in plastic bags. One good wave over the bow could cause mysterious misfires that would disappear once everything dried out. Maintenance was essentially double duty. Every Amphicar came with two owner's manuals, one for automotive service, one for marine operations. After each water excursion, owners had to grease 13 specific fittings to purge water from suspension and drivetrain components. The propeller shafts needed repacking every season. The bilge plug had to be removed and the hull drained. Salt water operations required complete undercarriage flushing within 24 hours or rust would eat through the floor pans within months. The factory recommended professional inspection of hull integrity every 500 water hours. The Amphicar's brakes were purely mechanical, using cables rather than hydraulics. The logic was simple. Hydraulic fluid and water don't mix. If a seal failed during water operations, you'd lose your brakes. The cable system was more maintenance intensive, but couldn't be compromised by water infiltration. The parking brake was especially important. It had to hold the car on steep boat ramps while switching between drive modes. Performance in rough water revealed the Amphicar's limitations. The freeboard, the distance from waterline to deck, was only about 14 inches. Any wave over 18 inches would send water into the cabin. The factory specified maximum wave height of 12 inches and winds under 25 mitre mange for safe operation. Coast Guard regulations required carrying life jackets, flares, and a horn, though the car's regular horn worked underwater, producing an eerie muffled honk that amused marina crowds. 
the suspension was basically standard car components beefed up for marine duty. Front suspension used leading arms with coil springs, while the rear had swing axles with coil springs. Every bushing was specially formulated rubber that could handle constant water immersion. The shock absorbers were double-sealed units filled with special fluid that wouldn't emulsify if water got past the seals. After 1964, the factory switched to a completely sealed suspension unit that proved much more reliable. Building the body required techniques borrowed from shipbuilding. The steel panels were first shaped on standard automotive presses, then continuously welded using methods typically reserved for fuel tanks. Every weld had to be perfect. One pinhole could sink the car. The factory tested each hull by filling it with water and checking for leaks before final assembly. The paint process included seven layers, primer, sealer, color coat, clear coat, then three applications of thick undercoating that acted as both sound deadening and additional waterproofing. The propellers were precisely calculated for the Amphicar's weight and engine output. Each bronze prop was 12 inches in diameter with a 14-inch pitch. They were handed, one turned clockwise, one counterclockwise, to eliminate torque steer in the water. The propeller shafts ran through special stuffing boxes filled with graphite-impregnated packing, too tight and they'd overheat, too loose and water would flood the bilge. Owners learned to adjust them by feel, tightening, until slight resistance was felt when turning by hand. Production numbers tell the story of ambition versus reality. 1961, 99 units, mostly for testing and promotion. 1962, 208 units as production ramped up. 1963 through 1965 were the peak years, with roughly 700 units annually. By 1967, sales had dropped to under 400 units. The final 1968 models were mostly assembled from remaining parts. Of the 3,878 built, approximately 3,046 were exported to the United States. The company had projected sales of 20,000 units annually. The reality was about 4,000 total over eight years. The Amphicar competed with nothing because nothing else like it existed in the civilian market. The closest military equivalent was the Volkswagen Schwimmwagen from World War II, but that was a stripped-down utility vehicle. The Amphicar had a full interior with seats for four, a heater that actually worked, and a convertible top for weather protection. It even had a decent-sized trunk, though the owner's manual warned against overloading it as it would affect the center of buoyancy. Buyers were an eclectic mix lakefront property owners who wanted to commute by water, hotel operators who used them as shuttle vehicles for guests. Police departments in lake communities bought them for patrol duties. The Coast Guard evaluated several for rescue operations, but found them too slow and unstable in rough conditions. Mostly, they went to adventurous individuals who wanted something nobody else had. The Quant Group, Amphicar's manufacturer, was better known for industrial batteries and BMW ownership stakes. They saw the Amphicar as a prestige project that would demonstrate German engineering prowess. The car was designed by Hans Trippel, who had been designing amphibious vehicles since the 1930s. His previous military designs worked well enough, but the Amphicar was his attempt at making the new concept practical for civilians. Quality control was exceptional by 1960s standards. Each car underwent a 120-point inspection before leaving the factory. Then came the water test. Every single Amphicar was driven into the company's test pool, operated for 30 minutes, then inspected for leaks. If even a tablespoon of water entered the cabin, the car went back for rework. The final test was a high-speed run on the Autobahn, to ensure roadworthiness. No other car manufacturer performed such extensive individual testing. The economics never worked. Each Amphicar cost approximately $3,200 to build, but retailed for $3,395. After dealer margins and shipping costs, the company lost money on every unit. The hope was that volume production would reduce costs 
but sales never reached the necessary levels. The Deutsche Mark's appreciation against the dollar in 1967 made exports even less profitable. By 1968, the company had accumulated losses of 8 million marks and ceased production. Modern collectors have discovered what original owners knew. Amphicars are surprisingly reliable if maintained properly. The mechanical simplicity that seemed crude in the 1960s now looks brilliant. No computers to corrode. No complex hydraulics to fail, just mechanical systems that can be repaired with basic tools. Parts availability is decent. Most engine components are shared with Triumph, and specialists manufacture reproduction body parts. Values have skyrocketed. A running Amphicar that sold for $5,000 in the 1990s now fetches $45,000 to $80,000 depending on condition. Fully restored examples with documentation can exceed $100,000. The irony is delicious. A car that lost money for its manufacturer and was considered a novelty now trades for more than contemporary Ferraris. But the real value isn't monetary. The Amphicar represents a moment when engineers tried something audacious just to see if they could. It wasn't trying to be the fastest car or the best boat. It was trying to be both adequately, which is arguably harder. Every engineering decision was a compromise, yet somehow those compromises added up to something that actually worked. The Amphicar asked a simple question. Why can't one vehicle do everything? The answer, it turns out, is that it can, just not particularly well. But not particularly well was still revolutionary when the alternative was not at all. Before the Amphicar, if you wanted to cross a lake, you needed a boat. The Amphicar said you could drive there instead, even if it took longer and felt slightly terrifying. Modern amphibious vehicles have better sealing, more power, superior stability, but they're military vehicles or millionaire toys, not something you could buy at a dealership and park in your driveway. The Amphicar democratized amphibious transportation, even if the democracy was small and slightly leaky. What made the Amphicar shocking wasn't its performance statistics or engineering innovation. It was its sheer normalcy. This wasn't a concept car behind glass at an auto show. It was a production vehicle with a warranty, sold through dealerships, registered with the DMV and the Coast Guard. You could finance it, insure it, and take it to your local mechanic for an oil change. The fact that you could also sail it across a lake was almost incidental. The engineering courage required to mass-produce an amphibious car in 1961 is hard to comprehend today. No computer simulations, no advanced materials, just slide rules, steel, and determination. Every problem had to be solved with mechanical solutions that could be manufactured affordably and repaired by average mechanics. The margin for error was zero. One failed door seal meant a sinking car and potential lawsuits. Yet they built nearly 4,000 of them, and most are still floating today. That bubble-topped 65-horsepower oddity that should have been a disaster instead became an icon. Not because it was great at anything, but because it worked at all. In an era of specialization, the Amphicar reminded us that sometimes the most shocking innovation is simply refusing to choose. The Amphicar died in 1968, killed by economics, not engineering. The concept was sound. The execution was remarkable. The market just wasn't ready for a car that could swim. Or maybe the world simply wasn't whimsical enough to embrace a vehicle that did everything adequately and nothing perfectly. Either way, for eight extraordinary years, you could walk into a dealership and buy a car that could literally drive across a lake. And sometimes that's enough to shock everyone. What's the most unusual vehicle you've ever seen actually work as advertised? Drop a comment below. And if you enjoyed this deep dive into amphibious engineering, make sure to subscribe for more stories of machines that shouldn't exist, but do anyway.